All right. But just don't even remark on it if it goes away. Or you could just say that we knew that that might happen and we're sorry. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. I hope you, you can hear me. This is the moment to say that there's some problem. Okay. And everyone should mute except for Ipshita. Good evening, everyone. A very warm welcome to this year's edition of QSTV Talks. My name is Ipshita, and it is my pleasure to introduce our second distinguished speaker. He's the N. Ramarao Professor of Computer Science at Cornell University. With a remarkable career at the forefront of distributed systems research, he has made significant contributions to the field, balancing protocols with strong guarantees and practical efficiency. He has written three textbooks and published more than 150 papers in prestigious journals and conferences. His work on the ISIS toolkit used in vital systems such as French air traffic control and the New York Stock Exchange showcases his dedication to creating dependable and efficient distributed systems. A fellow of both the ACM and IEEE, he has been honored with prestigious awards, including the IEEE CANI Award and the IEEE TCDP Award for his remarkable contributions to distributed computing. Today, we are fortunate to have him share his expertise with us on the topic, Fast Intelligence for IoT and Edge Applications. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Ken Berman. Okay, and uh, let me just add, uh, thank you so much for inviting me to speak and uh, to join you today. Uh, I'm going to comment in advance that my camera apparently is unreliable and I, the picture of me might disappear uh, but I think that the audio won't and that the uh, slides will keep displaying and we'll do our best. So uh, I'm going to give a talk, which is um, uh, going to be a small subset of the slides from a bigger talk that had a different title, uh, talk about uh, a software system we're building. I'm going to talk for about half an hour, um, aiming at a, a, a general audience, not experts. The bigger talk was for experts with many years of background and experience in distributed computing, which is when we use computer networks to connect programs together so that you build a big system that has many components. That's my area of research. And in my more advanced uh, graduate courses, it's what I talk about. And that's why I have this bigger talk. But uh, I think for your group, uh, I'll focus on the broader opportunity represented by what we call uh, IoT uh, and uh, edge intelligence. And so this opportunity focuses on the idea that just as we connected our mobile devices to the computing system called the cloud, which is just a fancy name for very big computer data centers with lots of computers in them, and it enabled us to create artificial intelligence like ChatGPT. Um, we can also start to think about connecting things in the real world into the cloud and then using intelligence in real time, meaning in the moment, make them accurate. But what I want to show you is that the computer software itself, the, the computer operating system, has a very big role in shaping the accuracy and the speed of modern computing systems. And that unless we focus on that layer, no other work that we do will be as effective. So my talk will be about the opportunity, but also about how computer science researchers identify the slow point, the problem, the barrier, and ask, what do we need to fix to take this step? And then what we can do about it. But because many people who are joining today have not had so much computer science background, I won't get technical about how to fix the problems. I'll just give you an idea of the kinds of things we do. So this picture was given to me by a friend of mine who has a, a very high position at Microsoft. 
Microsoft, as you know, many of the executives are, are Indian. And in fact, Ranveer Chandra, who gave me this picture, he is uh, in charge of Microsoft computer networking and Microsoft research on practical questions. And he was my PhD student at Cornell many years ago. We're still good friends, and I will actually visit with him soon. And he said to me, Ken, in America, we use first names, by the way. When he first came, he said, Professor Berman, but we trained him not to. So he said, Ken, we have a challenge that looks like your kind of problem. And this picture tries to show the challenge. And what it's showing is that in order to build real world intelligence, we really have to combine many kinds of systems. So one system might capture data from satellites that fly over agricultural fields or other kinds of settings. Uh, this example is coming from smart farming. So, of course, they would focus on whether the crops look healthy from high up in the sky, drought, indications of insect infestations or molds, other types of problems. On the bottom over here on the left, you can see the kinds of things drones are able to collect. This would be uh, photos that visualize how much moisture is in the soil. There's a river in the middle. It's blue. So obviously very moist is very blue. And then mud is a little bit less blue. And normal soil is green and dry patches are red. And this is an agricultural area with fields. And uh, we might also have historical information about the production of milk and cheese from our cows under different conditions. And the idea would be to combine these kinds of knowledge in order to answer questions for experts. And they have many, many kinds of questions. And even though I'm showing you a dairy and I'm showing you an agriculture region, these kinds of questions also arise in other kinds of settings, and I'll show you some other examples in one minute. Now, what my friend Reinveer pointed out was that when we have a situation like this, we create what the machine learning people call a mixture of experts or a mixture of models. They use the acronym MOM and MOE. And this is a kind of a graph, and here's the graph, in which the nodes in the graph are completely separate machine learning programs. So maybe this first node, oh, I'm sorry, maybe this first node over here, perhaps it's a weather prediction node. And above it, perhaps that's a node that's an expert in estimating soil moisture. And up here, Maybe this has to do with uh, knowledge about insects in the region. Each one of these separate expert systems makes a prediction. The weather says that uh, tomorrow a storm will come through. The flooding expert says that this particular area is prone to flooding. The mold prediction expert says they're going to have trouble with mold on the crops. Maybe they should harvest them today. And the idea here is that we build a layered system in which machine learning programs receive the output from other machine learning programs. And how would they do that? Well, one could write a file out and the next one could read the file in. One could send a message. Their computers can send messages just like we can send emails. One could send a message and the other could receive the message. You'd have to set that up in advance. As a programmer, there are ways to do that. And there are other methods as well. And the idea is that the event, perhaps that we got new pictures from the satellite, can trigger a series of actions. And it can go in layers until finally we can answer questions for human experts or we can take actions.
Sometimes people call this a style of computing that's based on cooperating MLs or distributed artificial intelligence. So here we have four different names that really are for the same thing. And if you hear mixture of experts or mixture of models or cooperative ML or distributed AI, really we're talking always about this kind of picture. And you can imagine running all these computers to run all these AIs would take a big cluster of compute systems. So we're going to be using some kind of uh, compute data center connected to the cameras and the other devices. And then individual nodes could be using techniques that those of you who are learning about ML have heard about in your courses, like transformers or distributed uh, deep neural networks or convolutional neural networks, different techniques for different purposes. Now, this same idea could be used in other settings. Uh, in uh, the areas where I travel and live, uh, bicycle deliveries create dangerous conditions in roadway intersections. It would be nice to put a big red light at those intersections and automatically have it light up red if there's a dangerous situation arising. Maybe that will be enough that this truck or the cars won't have an incident with the bicycle rider. In uh, Europe, uh, United States, I know in India, motorcycles sometimes go between the lines of cars. You can't always see that the motorcycle is coming. It would be nice if when I signal to turn right, my car said, no, don't do that now. That would involve a smart highway. And a smart highway or a smart city intersection doesn't look very much like a smart dairy farm. But when you think about the technical aspects, they're really very similar. This is another picture that Ranveer Chandra gave me from Microsoft. It's an idea that they have that they have not been able to commercialize yet. It has a woman wearing HoloLens. That's their heads-up display device. Now, these have to be very lightweight like a pair of sunglasses. So they have compute capability, but not very powerful because heavy computing is physically heavy. Nobody would want to wear a heavy computer device on their head. So a HoloLens is a bit like uh, a pair of sunglasses with fancy display hardware built in. And the computing that's needed to solve a problem needs to happen on a cluster of computers close by. Then we can solve problems like the one that's shown here. And so what we're seeing is that we've instrumented this factory device. Maybe it's a turbine or a jet engine or something. The instrumentation is gathering data about a vibration or some other problem. We're collecting that into, into a circuit diagram of the whole system combining it with other data and with this input wand. And we're able to use that to recommend to her that she should service this uh, red pipe. Maybe that's the source of the vibration problem. If you think about that, this would also require cooperative machine learning, a mixture of experts. <coughs> Same idea here, but now this doctor He's wearing the HoloLens. They've captured imaging of this medical patient's uh, bone structure, the skull and the spine, and what's called the cervical spine, the neck area. And the doctor would like to try to understand why this person experiences pain in their back when they move their arm. And in order to help the doctor localize the problem, we would find it necessary to align the image of the spine with the orientation of the patient. And in this way, when the patient moves her arm and says, now it hurts, the doctor should be able to see the computing system's hypothesis for which nerve 
is being pinched and then perhaps can devise a plan for helping her by using a drug or a surgery. And then during that surgery, you might even enable the doctor to see into the body so that they can see what they're doing as they do it. So this leads to this idea of edge intelligence for IoT. And so an edge intelligence system is a computing system satisfying a series of requirements. One requirement is that it has to be very fast. So the word real time, sometimes one word, sometimes people hyphenate it. Um, it refers to having small delay, the technical term is latency, and high data rate, bandwidth. People talk about bandwidth if they think bytes per second, and they talk about throughput if they mean events per second. We need both. So very good real-time characteristics. It must be easy to use such a system. Uh, there's been a great deal of work to create AI and ML solutions. It should be possible to just use that work and not have to create new code unless you're looking at a new need. We should be able to combine existing codes into a cooperative AI, like we make PowerPoint pictures. We should take advantage of hardware. The hardware accelerators make things cheap and fast, and that's very desirable. The acronyms I listed here are examples of famous kinds of hardware accelerators. GPU, for example, makes the graphics fast on our computers. RDMA is a kind of fast networking hardware. We won't talk about things at that level of detail today, but if you were a group of uh, people in Microsoft or PhD students, then we would talk at that level. And then there's an interesting question of what's called data consistency. <coughs> and what this involves is as data enters a system and then our software accesses that data, looks at it, how quickly can we be sure we will see the new data? And even generative AI needs this kind of help. Generative AI would be ChatGPT or DAL-E or other new bots. They also need to base their answers on the most current data. So they need a way to query databases and other things from the environment to give a, a good answer. Today, we just talk to them with text. But imagine what we'll be doing in five years or 10 years. In your career, you'll develop those kinds of applications and they will combine natural language with accessing data in real time. This is a way to visualize the word consistency that I used on my previous slide. This is from an electric power grid problem. If I had more time, I would tell you about it. But what we were interested in doing is detecting disruptions that cause the electric power to be unreliable. The lights might flicker, perhaps the power would go out and come back. Of course, this can cause damage. The doctor in the hospital doing an operation, the screen might suddenly fl flicker or flash. So we don't want those kinds of disruptions. Now, on the left, what you can see is that even though this, this is the same data flowing through the system, and I should explain what this data really is, what we did was to make a 20 by 20 array of sensors. People use IoT as a shorthand for Internet of Things, and they're talking about sensors that capture information in the real world. So we thought about a case here where we put 200, no, 400, 20 by 20, 400 power grid sensors into a kind of a power grid. And we looked at what would happen if a disruption went through. For example, when you turn on solar or you turn on wind or you turn it off, this can cause what's called a phase disruption for the IoT system that's detecting the state of the power grid. 
It moves at the speed of sound, and it looks a lot like a wave in water. And on the right is the true data. On the left is an example of what a computer AI might see if it accesses the data that was just acquired very soon after we capture the data. And you can see that it has a lot of mistakes. It's all full of noise. This noise is being caused by the fact that the computer operating system and computer platform wasn't designed to support real-time consistent computing. So any machine learning that we run on this data on the left is going to fight against the errors. It might see the same bicycle rider in the intersection in four different places. Or the bike might not even be visible because it's showing data from three seconds ago, all combined together, mashed together. And why is it making that mistake? Well, the existing computer systems aren't designed for real time. And unless we design a system to solve a problem, it won't do it very well. So the, uh, what we call the software architecture, the protocols and the algorithms that are used inside those systems, the design of the software wasn't designed to guarantee correct behavior. Here on the right, you can see that the problem is actually solvable. This is from one of our, our experiments, our system. But to solve it, you have to use the proper techniques. I have a picture showing some of the kinds of techniques. And I'm not going to be detailed, but I thought I would show you at this level. So when you use a modern computing system for IoT and you read data in, the data that gets put into the system actually can go into one of a collection of storage units. And this is showing six different storage units. Each of them has two computers that are working together to give a reliable, high-performance file system store. Okay, so you're used to having a storage device on your computer. This is as if you had 12 computers sitting next to each other, each pair, each two computers handling a different portion of the data. And it's being done automatically, so nobody sees that happening, using a fancy technique that I teach in my courses called Paxos and Consistent Cuts and State Machine Replication. But I won't tell you what those things mean because we don't have time in today's talk. And different files get put on different pairs. And sometimes putting data in needs to trigger a cooperative AI computation. And I'm showing that by showing a program. We use the notation lambda for a program that was watching for data. This is the surgical example, watching for that data. And when it sees that data come into the system, gets stored in the file system, it triggers some code. And that code triggers more code. And this could be one of those graphs. You remember I showed you the graph of machine learning with one expert talking to another expert. Well, this could be an expert that asks, could this be the nerve getting pinched? And it decides yes. So it runs two other experts to try to do detailed analysis. One of them says, I think I found something that should be highlighted for the doctor. And then this last lambda number four could be to make a picture that's vivid for the doctor. And all of this has to happen in real time with consistency. Other data is coming into the system at the same time. We're not able to do perfectly accurate timing. So you're not even sure what time it really happened at. The freshest data, the newest data, hasn't stabilized yet because it takes time between when you take a photo and when it's in the system. We're showing that at the bottom of this picture here with the dashes. And so computer systems like mine need to have algorithms, need to have solutions built into them to be able to look deeply into the data and give correct access so that when we visualize the picture, what the doctor sees is reality 
and is not some kind of mashup. There are other problems too, to make this fast. And I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna be very high level. So when that doctor's data came into the system, the HoloLens took a picture, what normally happens today is the picture first gets uploaded. It's done automatically, but it's just like when you upload a photo from your phone. It gets stored into a storage system, a kind of a file system, and then an AI can run on it. That Here's that Lambda we talked about, and maybe it's using an accelerator hardware like a GPU unit. And what has to do, done is it has to ask for the file system to give back the data. This is where mistakes were occurring in the current system that caused all that inconsistency. It had better give consistent data at this step. My system does. Cloud systems would not automatically do that. We have to actually move the data twice, first to the program, then into the GPU. And this all takes time. And this is actually why there are so many opportunities for inconsistency and slowness in today's system. And people have done work to improve on that. For example, for training computer intelligence, uh, there's a company called Databricks out that was created by Berkeley. It's already a $20 billion company after just two or three years because it sped things up using what's called caching. But that won't help in the edge settings that we're talking about because they don't loop very much. So what we do in my system is instead of <coughs> running the AI on a separate computer, we actually send the AI into the storage server. And this is a picture trying to show that idea. We take your program and we put it inside our system where the data is located. Now, if you remember, to make these systems scale and be big, we actually, remember I had 12 computers each doing part of the work. So we're gonna have to spread this out and divide it into groups. These are groups of three each instead of two each. Maybe it should be two each to look just like the other picture, but you can vary it based on how much load you wanna be able to handle. Three computers can handle more load than two computers. So there's an advantage for performance reasons. And then the idea is that when something happens, this is the street, the busy street corner picture, not the doctor. When some picture is captured, your program, your AI program can look at the picture and decide if it's interesting and trigger some computation inside a GPU. And that can trigger more computations. And we can make all of this very, very fast and we can guarantee consistency. And this is actually what we do in the Cascade system. The Cascade system is a kind of an operating system that you can put on a set of computers that are networked together. You can put machine learning programs into this system, and then you can build applications that look like data flow graphs and the nodes are these little lambdas. There's one of them right up here running. And they're in the same in the same address space, inside the same computer where the data is located and where the computing is going to occur on that accelerator. And when we do this, we get speed ups that are enormous. I'm going to skip ahead and show the kind of perform. Uh, this is a different setup of our system. Don't worry about this. Um, some of my people. This just illustrates that from one piece of AI runs until the next step, our system runs as fast as 12 microseconds, millionths of a second. It's pretty fast. So you can do many hundreds of, a th of thousands of actions per second on each computer, really, and has very high data transfer rates uh, equivalent to, uh, oh, I don't know, eight gigabytes is probably the amount of photo storage on your entire iPhone. So it can move all of that amount of data in one second for each second. And we can do it with very steady delay. I'll show you this picture in detail. But what this picture is showing is how much delay was there 
as a function of how fast data was being sent. It's very steady and small. That's the red lines here. Uh, here we varied whether we had one copy or three copies. Remember I showed you replicating data to have fault tolerance and have more load capacity. It doesn't make much difference for the small objects. The small objects are tiny little thumbnails that have uh, one kilobyte of data. The medium objects are a little bit bigger. The higher resolution photos, you can start to see the difference between making one copy and three copies. But the point is that putting the data in is extremely fast. That's the left axis. Until the systems overload, that's why it's flat and then suddenly it spikes up. And this just compares our performance, which is the orange here, very steady, very low delay, low latency in millionths of a second, microseconds. It's about uh, 30 or 40 for this example against uh, a, uh, a, a famous system that's widely used today called Kafka, Kafka Direct, actually, which is an even fancier version of it. And you want small bars that are very tight because that would correspond to real-time responses. And so you can see that we're getting very predictable, good real-time behavior. And the standard way of doing things is giving pretty bad, pretty bad behavior stretched out. Uh, this is a logarithmic scale. So actually you're seeing a factor of a thousand here. So the Kafka is a thousand times more likely to have a big delay would be one way to understand that. And we're very unlikely to have a big delay. This is down on the bottom is the size of the photos again. So I'm going to actually stop here. If I was talking to PhD students, I would tell you about exactly how we built this system. We built it using a, a, a software system called Derecho that was built in my group a few years ago. See if I can find you a picture of Sagar Ya. He was a PhD student from India who I worked with. I'm looking for a nice picture of him. There he is. So Sagar Ya was the, uh, the leader on building Derecho in my research group. He was a student just like you in India and then came to Cornell. He actually went to IIT Kragpur, and um, I hope I pronounced that sort of comprehensively. Uh, he joined my group, and uh, he was the leader working with this other fellow, Jonathan Behrens, to create the solution. I, I won't tell you the details. We have papers on that. Sagar is working now at Google, and he's one of the leaders in this area. Uh, other pictures you're seeing are other people who worked with me on the project. And I'll just mention, you saw women, you saw Indians, you saw Chinese people. We are a very diverse and very welcoming and very open. So the question we asked was, is it possible to build intelligence into systems that deal with the real world? And the answer that I have reached is that if we fix the limitations of the operating system, and then we can take existing AI, move it into these settings. And if we use the hardware accelerators people have begun to invent, the answer is yes. We actually can create intelligent systems for real world settings, like the ones I showed at the start. So I'm going to stop at this point. I'm actually going to stop my slides so that you can see me and then take questions uh, for half an hour or so. And let me, as I stop, let me just thank you for joining us today. I hope you have interesting questions. I'm happy to, to chat about them. Uh, Ipshita, for example, is thinking about how, how would she get into graduate school in, a, in the United States at MIT or Stanford or Cornell? We can talk about that. We have time for it. And in fact, I promised her we would, but maybe you have questions also. And in fact, she has a list of questions. And consistency in these dynamic applications. Well, of course, that question was a good one, but now we know the answer because that was the topic of my talk. So um, by lowering delay in a predictable way and enabling us to use hardware accelerated AI very close to where the devices like the HoloLens are located, we are able to get predictably steady, strongly consistent behavior out of the system. Now, Elaborating in the sense of, of uh, explaining the details, people uh, on this talk have a mixture of backgrounds. 
clearly whoever asked this question is much more familiar with distributed systems and databases. And I would love to give a very detailed answer, but I think that most people would feel that, that if they just had a little more background, they'd understand that, but they wouldn't follow that level of detail. So for that one person, I'll say that what we're doing is similar in, in, in the idea, at least to what's called snapshot isolation for databases, uh, that we do it by splitting the input side of our system, the data flow in separate from the uh, data query side. Uh, and then we have to build coordination algorithms um, based on ideas like Chandy uh, Lamport uh, consistent cuts. And by the way, Manny Chandy is another person who was originally an Indian student, just like many of you, and then became very, very famous. So we draw on techniques people have already developed. We've invented some of our own. And then all of this built together has given us that solution. And it's a very good question. Um, however, maybe a little too deep for uh, a broad audience. So. Yeah, thank you for that. So uh, the next question is about the use of IoT in automotive industry. So uh, with the rise of electric vehicles and other digitally connected cars, how do you see application for IoT and AI is in this sector? And can they help in traffic management and accident prevention in cities like Mumbai, NCR, Bangalore? Well, uh, yeah, as you mentioned, I'm the N. Rama Rao uh, Professor of Computer Science at Cornell. I was fortunate enough to work um, with uh, uh, actually um, Rohan Murthy from uh, the Infosys family. Uh, N. Rama Rao is actually the father of Murthy who founded Infosys. And I've, I've been to Bangalore and Chennai many times in Mysore. And I have to say that uh, technology cannot solve every problem. Um, it, obviously, we can create uh, tools that are predictable and safe to use and secure and private. But uh, there are always going to be social context questions and uh, infrastructure questions. So it, it depends, I think, a great deal on the evolution of India as a country and the evolution of your cities. If you can reach a point where a technical solution such as the intersection protection that I described would be valuable, there's still the question of, can we build such a thing? There we can help. But um, when I think about the traffic in Bangalore and Mysore the last time I visited, I think uh, there's a little homework to do before we reach a point where it's really a technical question that remains and not a social question. But having said that, I've come to India many times over many years, and the country is changing very fast, and it's a beautiful thing to see. And I think that there's a potential to think about the future and ask, where can we be in five years, in 10 years? Indian society is becoming more affluent. These cities are investing in their infrastructure. And there is a potential to reach a point where, yes, these kinds of technologies can be part of a much, much better solution. And if we think about the pollution, which is a problem in places like Delhi, less of a problem in Bangalore, at least when I've been there in Chennai and Mysore, um, well, electric cars really could reduce that pollution. And if we can improve the steady flow of traffic so that the cars aren't trapped in these intersections for hours, uh, perhaps we can even clean up the air and clean up the environment. Okay, so next we have a personalized question from someone uh, who saw the huge layoffs in tech, in tech, tech industries and AI is used in coding and hence chose core branches such as mechanical and electrical so that they have job options from these industries at, and at the same time they can code side by side to get a coding job. So do you think this is wise or they are being unreasonably scared of layoffs? Well, we live in an industry which is frightening that way and I'm very sympathetic uh, to the story you're telling because uh, friends of mine and in my family also have had these kinds of experiences. Uh, my brother-in-law was laid off from one job, then he got another job. What I would say is that we live in uh, an industry which is very fluid. And all of us need to be prepared to make these transitions during our lives and not terrified of them. But we no longer live in a world where people work for the same company for their entire career. Uh, so some people do. Uh, Ron Virchandra that I told you about joined Microsoft at the beginning of his career, and he's still there and become quite senior. 
But I think most people have the experience of moving a few times from company to company, maybe go to a startup at some point. And what this teaches is that uh, learning to think in uh, agile ways to approach new problems and to ask, what do I know that can be a partial solution? What needs to be invented? Sometimes the solutions don't already exist, but learning to try to be agile and to bring techniques from many areas together prepares you well to tackle problems which uh, your company might be looking at, and that makes you valuable for the company and not so easy to replace. And it also means that you're a contributor uh, to what become the products that produce the next generation of, of revenue. And so you're financially rewarded and more secure. So my recommendation is, first of all, that, that you're not wrong. You're, you're right to worry about this. But the answer is to train yourself to be an expert on specific things, but also to be good as a generalist good at bringing in things you've heard from different domains and asking, can we bring these together to solve problems? But when you think about, about spaceships and you think about next generation cars and you think about next generation hospitals, many kinds of technologies and many kinds of fields and disciplines are coming together. So if people say, should I do software or is it right to work in, in advanced metals or is it right to work in the next generation of chemistry or biology? The answer is everything is needed. All of these things have to happen. We can't solve the next COVID epidemic using software, but we probably can't solve it without using software. So all of these things come together. Learning to work in teams is also very valuable. The people are loners these days. And that's a mistake. You can't solve every problem yourself. You have to learn to be an effective collaborator in a group that might have five or 10 other people to respect that different people bring different talents and then to work together. And in fact, in my classes at Cornell, I often require that people work in groups. And in these groups, I require that different people have different talents and that they learn to collaborate because that's a very powerful tool. But you'll have different jobs in your life. It's a little frightening, but it will be okay. Yeah, so as you're talking about jobs, so anyone interested in pursuing their masters in the States and Europe, uh, so what do you think their approach to the admission process should be like? Any advice? Actually, this is a very interesting question because it happens that I've done that. Um, I, at Cornell, at least, Cornell is a, a, a private school, and it's not as large as some of the very big schools in the U.S., but it's famous. We're in the top five uh, in the U.S. ranking, uh, and so probably we're in the top 15 worldwide, maybe even the top 10. Uh, it's a little hard to, to rank things linearly, but so we're a very competitive and very uh, sought-after degree. Uh, and I've actually been in charge of the faculty committee that was responsible for Ph.D. admission and in the past for MS admission, and at one point I did MEng admission too. These were all different graduate degrees. MEng tend to be people who are going for a quick degree and then into industry. They need a little more experience and they maybe they also need a visa. Uh, MS is a slightly longer program with more of a project focus and you do a, a project thesis, but then you might still go into industry. And then PhD uh, is for people who are trying to do advanced idea creation and to break into new domains like what Sagar Yatsha did uh, in the work that I showed you. And um, to do the uh, selection, we, we approach it differently at each of these levels. For MNG, where the student is actually paying the tuition, and I should warn that uh, different universities have very different cost structures. So when you apply to these schools, you must always look to see what will it cost me if I get into this school and want to go there, can I afford to do this? If, if the answer is not always yes. Uh, in America, there are uh, banks that give loans. And so Americans who get an MNG degree borrow the money. But if you're international and you're trying to come, it's not necessarily uh, a cheap thing. Anyhow, the MNG students, the question is, will they do well in our program? And we look at their academic performance. 
the MS students, we asked, do they have the ability to do a large independent project? And when we assess their applications, we ask, have they done large projects that look independent? And how did that go? And what were those projects? Also, do we have faculty interested in supervising projects in the area the student is in? You can be a brilliant student, but if we don't have a person who's matched, we would not admit you anyway because there needs to be a person to supervise. And PhD is the same philosophy, but taken even further, where we'll look at somebody and we'll say, do we see evidence that this person is an innovator who can expand the limits of the field? That's what research is really about. Finding open questions that are important questions and answering them and showing that this leads to a big advance, some form of important progress. So there we ask, do we have faculty members who are trying to build up their groups and who have a need? And then we ask, does this candidate match that need? We look at their grades, but we also look at the independent work they've done. And we look at letters from faculty members and other researchers who collaborated or supervised on that research and who can say, this person, Ipshita, it was amazing in our group. She came to Microsoft for two months on a uh, such and such internship, and uh, during that period contributed to a very exciting project. Uh, it was a big success, but she was also a great team member. And we look for this rounded story and this kind of experience. So if you want to go to uh, PhD research, you should be asking, how can I find my path into a research experience? And that usually involves learning material at an undergraduate level, starting to do projects that are not independent, and then over time, gaining confidence in the supervisors, and then they start to give you more freedom, and they write those very good letters for you. You can't skip those steps. MS is easier, but doesn't give you guaranteed access to PhD. MNG is much easier to get into. They're asking, is this a person that Microsoft or Qualcomm or NVIDIA will want to hire and will they do well in our program? And can they afford to pay the tuition? And because schools are so different, different schools, the answer might be different for the same person. So, so that's, that, that's the way that we think about it. And that's the way you should think about it. Oh, that was very informative. Thank you for that. And so uh, the next question is, what role could IoT play in the future development of AI models like ChatGPT? I think this is a super, super exciting question. And it's a good example of a research question. You know, there also are practical questions. So I talk to companies. The companies say, oh, today uh, we have uh, a shop floor and we're fabricating such and such a component for machinery, maybe for cars. And sometimes the fabrication isn't perfect and we need to assess the part I would like to use ChatGPT to tell the system to check for this type of problem or to ask it where the issue might be coming from. So there are very practical questions that we almost can do now. Just understanding what the person is asking might be enough to solve those questions. But then as you start to think a little bit more about a science fiction kind of world where we can just talk to devices. My, my watch is listening if I wanted to right now, and I can ask questions about the world and I can get intelligent answers. Uh, there's so much more that you can imagine doing. And uh, people who are creative and have very good ideas, and maybe they're, they're very good at watching TV and watching science fiction movies or reading science, and they can dream of things and say, well, this is actually possible. We can do this and it will be better than in the books I read and make these things real. There's a great potential. And, and I think the potential includes hospitals where the doctors are not working so hard and yet they're able to do more for their patients more effectively. I really do think that someday we will fix some of the traffic problems in places like, like Bangalore. Um, and I think that we'll create a world in which we actually use technology to solve problems like global warming. Uh, the power grid example I gave briefly actually came from big power grids trying to make better use of solar and better use of, of power. And, and they were saying, when we turn on the solar array, it, it disrupts the entire regional power grid. Can we 
dampen that down? Well, you have to recognize the disruption and compensate for it. And that was their idea. And in fact, we helped them solve such problems. So I think that, you know, these, these problems, there isn't a yes or a no. And the answer is yes to the question. But the real question, answer is that technology is a tool and we have these very powerful tools now. And what's needed is for clever, resourceful people with good training to come and say, here's a problem I'm excited about, something that I have a person. Uh, so our last question for you is, uh, as we witness the exponential growth of IoT and edge computing, what do you foresee as the most significant opportunities and challenges in the coming years? And how? Well, let me answer this question. And then what I want to say is that in my career now, I've seen computing since more than 40 years ago when I was uh, quite young as they would face challenges that are quite hard and they're not going to solve those so easily. So people can say, oh, look at how rapidly we're advancing. These cars can drive themselves. It's true. And it's very impressive. And yet, you know perfectly well that if we deployed all of these self-driving cars, they would create accidents, they would go off roads, they would misinterpret things. They don't already have this problem, even in San Francisco. They have intersections where the self-driving cars all reach the intersection and none of them advances. And they all just pile up. And there's also, there was a famous one, some poor woman, she lived on a street, every self-driving car from uh, Tesla, I believe, um, would drive onto her street, turn around in her driveway and drive off. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds every hour. Just all of them driving and turning around. Somehow it was a bug, of course. So when you see people who talk about exponential progress, you have to sort of set that to the side in your mind and say, yes, we're making amazing progress. Chat GPT is remarkable because it lets us understand what people are saying much more effectively. And that enables sudden progress on a bunch of questions. But Chat GPT is not real intelligence. And that tool is only a tool. And almost as quickly as it takes off, you begin to exhaust those opportunities. And it gets much harder because you're suddenly looking at things that require real intelligence. ChatGPT, no matter how many trillions of parameters we give it, isn't really intelligent. We haven't figured out how to do artificial general intelligence, no matter what anybody will tell you. Those cars, the failure they have is because they're not artificially generally intelligent. And when you watch a movie where, you know, artificial general intelligence just pops up, that's not how it's going to happen. It took humanity a billion years to get to the point where over 10 or 20,000 years we could develop what we have as intelligence now. It's going to take a long time before computing reaches that point. So I think it takes a degree of humility and it takes an understanding that each technology area, an advance occurs, it's disruptive and change. Everybody gets overexcited. Think about crypto. Three years ago, all your friends were only talking about crypto. Now everybody's wondering, is this really just tax evasion? Are these people basically creating NFTs for really bad photos and then somebody's buying them for a high amount of money? Does that make sense? And you have to ask this about almost every area. Chat GPT people talk about, you know, automated doctors. Well, doctors have to figure out what's wrong with you. Is it really true that Chat GPT could do that? I don't think so. On the other hand, Chat GPT might understand a question much better than the previous systems. So it takes a degree of humility to work in technology. And you need to never let yourself get overly excited, but also not to be too pessimistic either. And to understand that this is just engineering with the next generation of tools, and we can build the next generation of solutions.
But those solutions are really valuable. Look at how useful your iPhone or your Android actually is. All sorts of things that you depend on every day. So sometimes we get it right and things become tremendously valuable. I think ChatGPT is like that, but not better than that. So I can't manage without my iPhone. ChatGPT in the iPhone is awesome. And someday I'll say I can't manage, but it won't change who I am. I'm still a human being. It's not going to change the world. And it's not like these smart robots you see in the movies where then they go crazy and take over the world. Okay. So anyhow, I'm going to thank everybody. I've taken enough of your time now. Reach out to me by email if you have a question that you wanted answered, but that I didn't get a chance to answer. Uh, my slides are available if you would like. They're right on my webpage, actually. Then you can see the parts I skipped. And you can also read, I have a textbook. <clears throat> In fact, it was mentioned I have three of them. The most recent one is already out of date anyhow. And there are also research papers on everything I talked about. So thank you so much for inviting me. It's wonderful to have been able to join you. I wish I was over in India. I love visiting when I have chances to do it. I never, I never say no. And uh, good luck to everyone. Okay. Thank you very much so, for sharing your wonderful insights. We truly appreciate you taking off time of your busy schedule and being with us today. Uh, to our wonderful audience, thank you for your active participation and engaging questions. Your enthusiasm and curiosity have made this event even more enjoyable. We hope you found today's session informative and inspiring. And with that, we conclude our second session of QSTB DOS 23. Stay tuned for more inspiring sessions with exceptional individuals from various fields.